Hello everyone, Karen Glasser here and welcome to The Peak Stage, a show about wonderful personal stories, inspiration, and the never-ending pursuit of what's next. The Peak Stage is brought to you by Vital C, the guide to living in a stage of growth, purpose, and discovery. With guests from all walks of life, join us as we learn and share their inspiring stories of reinvention, resilience, and perspective. Likewise, our stories are still being written with one thing that we know for sure, we are not done yet. Today, we welcome Craig Taubman to the stage. Craig has enjoyed a very successful career in television and film, composing music for the critically acclaimed HBO animated series, Happily Ever After, and Sherry Lewis's PBS series, Charlie Horse Pizza. His music has been featured in the Paramount Pictures feature film, Andre, New Line Cinema's Pinocchio, and Disney's animated short film, Recycle Works. His extensive musical catalog consists of over 50 recordings, featuring everything from Friday Night Live to Rockin' Toontown, featuring backup vocals with, of course, Minnie and Mickey. Craig's sellout concerts draw thousands of fans at such respected venues as Ravinia in Chicago, Westbury Music Fair in New York, the Greek Theater in Los Angeles, and three very special performances at the White House. These days, Craig has been focusing his energies on building the Pico Union Project, and most recently being appointed a Los Angeles County Commissioner. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Craig in. Welcome to the show. Craig, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. So the one thing I didn't say right. is that okay. we're brother I want to make sure you're going to mention that. I'm, I have to mention it. Craig and I are brother and sister. Um, I was born first. He was born second. And I know, you know, we all started singing together very, very young. And I know you have a picture that you're going to put up there. So why don't you show us this picture? Yeah, I know that she was born first because if you'll notice uh, in the in the tagging down below, she has capital letters and I'm lowercase. Just just point that out. Just saying. Just saying. So this was uh, this is the picture that Karen and I are referring to. Oh my gosh. Uh, Karen and I are in the middle, and my younger brother is on. Uh, her left and my sister, my younger sister is on the right. And we actually were in a music performing group uh, a we long were. time ago. Oh my, well, <laughs> a long time ago. A long, long time ago in another st uh, stage of, of life. Um, and it, they're great memories. And um, clearly we have a musical family, but you took it to the next, next stage. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that right now in terms of re reinvention and the past and the present, can you identify any moments in your past that have helped form who you are today? Most definitely. And you gave me some prompts earlier this week to think about, so I've been thinking about them. And uh, one of them is that I don't think too much about uh, where I was, but more about where I am and mm -hmm. uh, I don't really worry about where I'll be. Um, and that that is, um, I think, a really significant thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that was formed. My sense is very, very early um, from our parents. I think that they taught us something. I don't know if it was by design either, but I always knew growing up or always assumed growing up that I would be successful. I didn't know where I would be successful or what I would be doing. I, there are perhaps assumptions right. you know, that I might be doing this or I might be doing that, but I never, uh, never really planned on it. I never really obsessed on it. I always was focused on where I was at that time. Anything else I could wax poetic about and say, well, yeah, I did this or I did that. And I probably didn't even do it. I was just ad libbing. Right. You know, who's going to fact check it, especially back then and right. the future. I just, well, I was going to be successful, whatever I would do. And I think all of the kids in the family, all of our siblings were very similar. Um, we have four incredibly accomplished, very, very different siblings, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. None of us, however, actually received a college degree. I went to three universities. I have six years of college under my belt, three in Israel, one at UCLA, two at Northridge, University of Judaism, and never really wasn't important for me to get a degree. It just didn't matter. Uh, 
And do you think, but Craig, do you think it's because how you define success? And I, I, I think that begs the question. So how do you de define success? You always knew you were going to be successful. What did that mean to you? Money, um, uh, thing? Money, money never played into it. Okay. Never played into it. I never did anything or did not do anything mm -hmm. because of the remuneration that I might receive. Um. I just, I think it was privilege. I think hmm. I was blessed to be born with this idea in my head, either mm -hmm. by nature or nurture, mm -hmm. that I could do anything. Right. Now, I, that, I, I would always set the goalposts far ahead or high right. up or lower down or to the left or right. I didn't right. follow any specific agenda. But I also was never afraid to move the goalpost. I was never afraid to say, yeah. you know, actually, I don't want a goalpost. Let's just stick up a, a, a flag somewhere and just yeah. go for it. Or I, change the game altogether. I'll just play tennis. I'm not going to play football. It's not right. Really my game. And we are very similar that way. I think, you know, we just we just do whatever what's next is. We don't really give it much thought yeah. other than we're going to go for it and just do it. Um, is it hard to reinvent yourself? Because we're going to be talking a little bit about how you've gone from the music and you're still obviously very involved in the music, but to something very deep in, in, in your heart. I think it's your legacy. We've talked about this before. Is it hard to reinvent yourself to go from music to being the owner of this building that, you know, creates life for so many people? The challenge for me is that I'm 63 years old and I'm still as driven, perhaps even more driven than I was when I was 53 or 43 or 33. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty is that I'm, I'm not quite as healthy or as fit, mm -hmm. but I still have the same drive. I right. still have the same desire to be the best me that I can be today. Um, and again, going back to, I don't plan on it. Right. And, and there's a great Yiddish line that, people plan and God laughs, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I make, I make, I have thoughts about where I want to be, but I don't, and I expect I'll get there, but if I don't get there, I'm not really disappointed right. because right. It, it, no, it's not. Let me just answer your question. No, it's not difficult for me to check. <laughs> I'm not planning 10 years out what, right. what that right. would be. I didn't say, right. for example, uh, when I'm 63, I want to be appointed a county commissioner. I didn't. I wouldn't have known when exactly. I was 61 what a county commissioner was. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I want to um, bring up some um, pictures uh, that that you actually sent to me. We talked about um, your music, and um, we. I put three of your CD covers up on the screen. Uh, I see that I'm still wearing one of the same shirts. <laughs> Is in that Tune the same Town, shirt? I think I'm still wearing a, a, a denim shirt. There's something very wrong here. Well, um, you know what? Go, we're going to go for that, though. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the uh, album covers. You have Rockin' Toontown and we have Rockin' Together. There. Let's talk about Toontown. You, that was very exciting for all of us to see what was going on with you. You launched with your music part of Disneyland's Rockin' Toontown, right? Well, we, we launched Toontown. Yeah, you know, wow. all of my albums were were rock in together, morning in night. Uh, yeah, rock exactly. in Toontown, and yeah. uh, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. We sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of albums. I performed with the characters. I performed all over the country with the characters. I probably made less money in that gig than ever <laughs> on any gig I ever made, but it gave me. You know, even today, there are still a handful of people. And I mean, a very small handful of people say, oh, you're the Disney guy. You're the Disney yeah, guy. Well, yeah, that, yeah, that was yeah. like a lifetime ago. But it gave me credibility and right. gave me an opportunity to do the other stuff that I did, which was writing for television that right. you mentioned, you know, right. the Happily Ever After. Another one that you didn't mention, which was probably not that popular, but it was something called Rimba's Island. And yeah. I wrote uh, 26 Three years, 26 episodes, and every uh, episode had five original songs of mine. And, you know, that wow. was that was an amazing blessing. And, and uh, I wasn't really a composer, but I, I right. started writing more and more and more. And if you're writing that many songs a year, you get better at your craft. You know, the 10,000 hour rule. 
Yeah. Do anything long enough, you'll get absolutely. Good at it. Absolutely. So you did mention that you have the N in all of your things. So you have Rock In Together. What right. was that CD all about? That that, well, that had my my uh, a medley of my greatest hit, which was one amazing great hit, and it was in honor of my son Noah's first haircut. Yes. And he was two <laughs> years old and he got a haircut, and I wrote this song. What you need is a haircut. And, and, and um, fun, yeah. fun, fun, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I can actually say something that happened to me that was formative here. When I was, I, I went to UCLA for one year, and then from UCLA, I moved to Israel for what I thought would be one year. Mm -hmm. And that one year turned out to be about two and a half years. Right. And when I was in Israel, I was introduced to some amazing, amazing kids' music. Specifically, one album which was called um, Kevis Hashisasar, the 16th Sheep. And it was written by Yonatan Geffen and David Broza and Yehudi Ravitz. Mm. And it was much different than any kid song that I had ever heard before, any family song. Instead of talking about, I roll the ball to mommy, she rolls the ball to me, it talked about things like um, feelings and emotions. Yeah. It wasn't cognitive skills. It was, it was social skills, right. jealousy, uh, being afraid. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to the States as a 22 year old, um, and met my wife, like two years later, who was a nursery school director, um, instead of writing, and, and, and I was an unemployed musician, instead right. of writing <laughs> kids songs that were not dealing with emotional issues, uh, uh, instead of writing kids songs that dealt with ABC and whatever, I started writing kid songs about emotional issues. And you and I wrote many, many songs together and performed right. many times. Right. That I think was a tipping point for me in writing things and doing things that speak to you, not just doing them that you think that they'll be lucrative or you think that they will elevate your stature in your community, but rather do things- So important. To oh you and elevate who yeah. you are as yeah. a human being. So important. I mean, that, that, that says it all right there. And you know what you're, and you're, you're very humble about this. You're, you're probably, if not the most known, one of the most known Jewish um, musician, composer, artists in the world. You travel around the world, your Friday night live service. Um, I, how many years ago did you do this? 20, 25 years. But there would be an example years. of what I was ca saying, Karen, earlier that I didn't plan on Friday Night Live. I was right. writing music. I was still writing music for Disney. I was still writing uh, television stuff. That's how I was making a living. And at the right. time, especially at the time for me, it was a very good living. You know, yeah. it, was, it was better than anything I ever could have imagined. Right. When Rabbi Wolfie came to me with this idea to do a young professional service. Um, and I said, what's a young professional service? <laughs> he said, well, you know, we're going to attract younger people. I said, oh, that's an issue. He says, it's the perennial Jewish issue. It's, and I said, well, I think it's the perennial human issue. How do you attract yeah. younger right. people to do what was important for you when you were younger? So he, he came up with this idea. I said, no, what I want to do is I have two young kids. I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old. Let's do a family service, kids music kids service. Right. And he said, no, I really want to do an older service, you know, a service for right. older people, uh, 25 to 40, 39, I think was the age, which was good because I was 36 and he was 36. So there was a cutoff there. There was a cutoff there. And this, right. this album made this, this CD, this album, I mean, I think it first was an album, right? Back in those it times. Was, well, for one year we did the service that attracted yeah. at the time, maybe three, 400 people, which, you know, everybody thought well, that's crazy. You're not you can't attract right. that. So attracting 2000 people on the right. second Friday of every month. It became a phenomenon here and, and quite all frankly, over the, yeah. all over the world. All you had to do is walk into almost any synagogue on a Friday night and one or many of your uh, songs were being played. You you made it um, approachable and you made it um, for, for people everywhere to be able to experience music in a way that they wanted to exp experience mm -hmm. music. I want to move down to the, the next thing, and that is Jewels of Elul. You've been doing this for how many years? And let's tell everybody what that is. Uh, I've been doing it for 16 years, um, but I, there, I've been doing it for 18 years, but there are 16 volumes because I took off a year and 
at some point. Mm -hmm. And then another year, I just did a best of. But 18 years. So it was within the window of Friday Night Live. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea was this. There are 29 days to the Jewish month, the Hebrew month of Elul. Mm -hmm. And it is the month that precedes the High Holy Days. And you are supposed to, according to Jewish tradition, use that time to prepare for the holidays. Right. Now, most people in modern society prepare by buying a new pair of shoes, a new belt, a new suit, a new right. dress. Um, but the tradition says you should wake up in the morning, hear the shofar, the sound of the shofar for 29 days, and study to become a better human being. I thought that was an amazing tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, what if I would create 29 introspections and publish them? Right. And then I said, who's going to want to read 29 introspections of me? What if I get 29 people from different walks of life? Very, very much informed by Friday Night Live, by the way, on two levels. One, at Friday Night Live, um, I saw, and Disney too, I saw the power of scaling. That if you can do it for one person, right. it's not that much hard. Diff more difficult to do it for 101 people or 1,001 people. So we, we scaled it. And any time that we would invite somebody else to Friday Night Live that wasn't me, that wasn't David, uh, David as in Rabbi Wolpe, it would always be more interesting. So Rick Warren would come from Saddleback Church numerous times. And people say, what do you have a pastor, an evangelical pastor coming? Right. What can he possibly teach us? And we'll say, well, find out. Right. Ellie Wiesel, people, uh, and we had, we had black pastors come, Mark Whitlock and Chip Murray, and uh, people from the, the police and people from who were, were anti-police. Anytime there was the other, we always grew. Jules Elul featured 29 different people people every, every single year, year. And so, specific yeah. give us some of the just give us some names because i didn't mention at the beginning give us some names that actually participated in this to understand the the, the reach that this had okay uh there's this guy barack obama john mccain jeffrey katzenberg debbie friedman theo bikel desmond tutu lady gaga um about rabbis from every walk of life, imams, um, you pretty much name it, any category, and they were there. And this is a significant thing, too. She'ein lacha adam she'ein lo sha'a. I firmly believe that everybody in this world has their place and has their time. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that is blocking them is one's ability to be open to the other. Our Aunt Ruth used to say something, a Yiddish uh, uh, statement that said, um, God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we'd listen twice as much as we talk. Right, right. I was chastised during my the second or third year of Jewels of Elul for putting a black man, uh, Chip Murray, Pastor Chip Murray, Cecil Murray, in the Jewels. And somebody said, what can I possibly learn from a black man about the high holidays? Again, my response was, find out, read it. And, that and opened up the floodgates. I said, I am going to, if anybody in the Jewish community can actually say that in 2008 or nine, whatever, then I'm not, I'm not interested. So Jewels of Elul became a stepping stone. I see you're prodding me along, a stepping stone actually to this picture here, Pico Union right. Project. So tell us a little bit about peaks. It, you, you have, this is part of the reinvention that I use the word reinvention. You're just simply going to what's next, but tell us a little bit about the Pico union project and where it started and where it is today, because it is phenomenal. And as you talk about it, I'm going to share some other photos um, that you sent to me that, that wow. this is the front, right? This is the front of the building. Right. So the front of the building is the oldest synagogue building in Los Angeles. It was built in 1909 at the place where I started Friday Night Live with Rabbi Wolpe. This is the first home of Sinai Temple. This wow. was settled by Russian immigrant Jews who were all Orthodox. 
and then one day decided, you know what, we want to be a little more American, a little less old country. We want to be more American and built this building that had an organ and just remarkable, remarkable uh, architecture. Um, I'll, I'll get to that picture in, in one second. Yeah, sure. um, my wife and I were introduced to the building in 2013 uh, by Steve Sass, who was the head of the Jewish Historic Society. And he said, the first home of Sinai Temple is for sale. You should buy it. <laughs> and I said, the first home of Sinai Temple, are you talking about the one downtown? And, and he said, yes. I said, first of all, it's not a temple anymore. It's a church mm -hmm. and it's old. And I don't have money to buy a building like that. And it was millions of dollars. It was like extraordinary amount of money. And I walked in maybe six months later and finally went there. And I looked at the building and I said, I'm going to buy it. Now, wow. again, it's dilapidated. It's in a really a challenged part of the community. Right. And, um, and I don't have the money. And I speak with the elders of the church and I say, I want to buy it. And they say, we want to sell it to you. And I said, but I don't have the money. They said, make a love offering. I said, what's a love offering? Wow. Come up with an amount of money that you think is fair and something that you can afford and make an offering. I'd never heard that notion before. I'd heard of wow. tithing that you give a percentage of your income. I've heard of people negotiating back and forth and, and humiliating people for too low of an offer right. or bullying people and saying, I'm going to, I just want another hundred thousand dollars or five, ten thousand dollars Louise and I made an offering from our heart and they said, okay. And wow. I was like, what do you mean? Okay. <laughs> now you own a building. Now, now what? you own a building in downtown LA as well as a parking lot. Uh, it's right. actually a double parking lot with 50 spaces. My real estate friends say the building's nice. The parking lot, is that's that's the gold mine what you're looking at here is an iteration of of uh who i am an iteration of jewels of alol an iteration of what i learned at disney an iteration from what i learned from our parents that anything's possible and that nothing is set in stone even when you die it's not set in stone right. you decompose but your spirit goes on and morphs and changes Right. The I, original idea was to create a club at the Pico Union. And my daughter, who I asked late in 2013, Abby, what would you do if you bought this place? And she looked at me and she said, I'm a white, Jewish, privileged young woman. And you're asking me what to do in the poorest neighborhood of Los Angeles. Why don't you ask the people in the community? There you go. Like, where did where did you get that, Abby? And she said, what do you mean, where did I get it from? I got it from you and mommy. You guys are the most community-minded right. people. Ask, ask the community. They didn't want a scotch bar and a club and a restaurant right. in their neighborhood. They, their concerns were housing. Their concerns were food justice, food right. insecurity. And within six months of talking to the community, we created, instead of a for-profit venture, we created a, a club for profit venture. We created the Pico Union Project with one of the staples of what we do is distribution of fresh produce at that time in the picture you see here to, you know, 50 families, 100 families. Within two, three years, there were 250 families coming every other week. Right. The pandemic hit of March of 2020 and the need became Huge. Yeah, huge. Mind-boggling. Right. Uh, and we went from twice a month to twice a week, feeding up to 2,000 families between 20 and 30 pounds of fresh produce every week. And, and you grow there, too. You actually grow right, right so that's on the a, That's a very important yeah. thing that you're, you're mentioning, that, you know, at a certain point, we said, you can, you can give away food to your blue in the face. And there's plenty of food to give away, by the way. 40% of all produce grown in America is thrown away. Is just, and that's the produce we get. And it's A produce, most of it. Some of it's B. Um, but we wanted, especially in our community, which is Salvadoran, mostly Oaxacan, Mexican, Central American, Nicaragua, El Salvador. They're amazing gardeners. They don't have grocery right. stores where they grow up, but they know how to grow food. Right. So we've planted right. a grove of about 
a hundred fruit trees, including 60 avocados, um, uh, citrus trees. Uh, and essentially we took over a, a, a freeway underpass or overpass the side of a mountain and we, we've created a garden there. So you mentioned the pandemic, you mentioned during this time, the, the need became huge to be able to feed people. And ultimately um, you also had a vaccination site. You have a vaccination site. Tomorrow so morning uh, from nine out. till three, we will test and vaccinate. You know, at one point we were testing and vaccinating like 300 people a day. Right Now we'll be lucky if we get 50 people that we test and 20 people that are vaccinated. Um, so yeah. I, I'm, I kind of sped through that because I want to go, uh, you, you deal with all demographics. You, you deal with the old and you deal with the young, right? Uh, or yeah. as we call the peak stage and the young. And I, I laughed this morning when we first came on and I said, you have a, a camp? So PUP stands for Pico Union Project. And tell us just briefly about these adorable kids that are holding picture frames um, that they, they made. So tell right. us about this. So this is like three, four years ago. Um, I don't recognize any of these kids, but Louise definitely will, my wife. She does art projects there. And, um, you know, talk about privilege. Y you and I went to camp. When I was nine years old, I went to camp for four weeks. Right. right. Uh, it was $290 there. Uh, the average income in this community is $20,000 per household, mm. per household. And every household might have two, three families in a one bedroom apartment with two, three families and one, one bathroom and maybe a kitchen air area that has a hot plate. Right. Um, camp is not part of their vernacular, not right. part of their experience. So during the summer, we would do art programs and, and do amazing, wonderful things, but it's still in the, in the middle of, of a urban right. uh, desert. I mean, it's, it's the city, uh, urban, wait, urban desert. Yes. Urban desert. Yes. So, we tried to give them a, an experience. And this year we are blessed to partner with Camp Bob Waldorf and sent 10 kids to camp wow. for a week. And um, many of them learned how to swim for the first time. Uh, many of them went on a bus for the first time. Uh, all of them had never been away from home. This never would have happened five years ago because no kid would leave their parent. No parent would leave their kid with a stranger. So we've built a degree of trust in the community. And next year, our goal is to send 50 kids from the community to camp. And um, we already raised the money for it. And it's not that big a deal because it's $100 to go to camp for these kids. But it's a big deal for them. And, and not a big financial. Yes. Thing. And what's interesting, I mean, you have tied together everything that you have done um, each, each step that you have done, you have tied together uh, from, from being taught that, from, from coming from who you are as a person. Um, you, you are, you, Hilda Solis, who is a supervisor in Los Angeles, uh, um, she has become not just a huge fan of yours, but a huge supporter of you. And she has helped make sure that money is, is given when it needs to be given. Um, and, and she was ultimately the one that um, asked you to become a commissioner. Right. So, you know, you started the conversation by saying, who knew at 61, even at 61, to be a commissioner and what, what the hell is a commissioner, right? Mm -hmm. So you're now a commissioner. So what does that mean in this next stage? I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> uh, last week, I was actually just asked to chair on, on the commission that I serve, a committee um, to oversee and evaluate a program in Boyle Heights that is a $4 million annual budget mm -hmm. uh, and to see if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. My, the commission that I'm a part of um, is uh, called, I don't know what it's called, Accountability and Efficiency. So our job is to go and see how efficient some of the programs of the county. But are. who better than you? I mean, you, you, you just, you're not just talking the talk. You've walked the talk at this point. You have done it. You, you have made your own mistakes. You have then taken in there the step forward. So congratulations. I'm very proud of you, as you know. Thank you. I, truly, Thank I, you. I think that is something to, to brag about. So I, I do brag about you all the time. 
you know, here at the peak stage, we would rather than focus on topics that keep us up at night. And we know what those topics are. We know as we, as we get a little bit older, you know, we think about illness and disease. We at the peak stage would rather focus on those things that get us out of bed in the morning um, that we're passionate about. So that begs the question, Craig, I mean, you have already done so much. Um, what's next? What are you doing next? Well, uh, this might not be <laughs> the, the, the most appropriate answer or might not be what you wanted to hear. But I think next for me is slowing down a little bit and just being more present. Mm -hmm. There's a great expression that um, somebody taught Louise, my wife, who I've, you know, that, that's another thing. I've, I've been blessed in my life to have mentors, uh, older mentors and younger mentors. I mm -hmm. love older people. Um, and, and I've been also blessed to have my wife, who's very, very different than me. And from another, you know, she grew up differently. Uh, and she, she's, she's taught me, what's next? Well, according to her friend who met me, she said, how would you define Craig? And she, is he a human being or a human doing? And mm. she very proudly said, well, of course, he's a human doing. And she said, I, I sense that maybe you should try harder uh, to be a human being. Wow. Simply be present. And I, I, I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but, but to do less and to be more in the moment. I love that. I do. Actually, I love that answer. So I am really happy that that is your answer. As, as our viewers are watching this, they're probably saying, okay, I need to go find out a little bit more about Pico Union Project. I need to go do this. So we're going to give everyone an actual, um, the ability to go check you out and check out the picounionproject.org. You're going to see all sorts of amazing programs that are going on there. You can participate if financially or not financially. You can volunteer. There are so many things that you can do at Pico Union Project. If you are a parent and you have young youngins, little ones, that um, Craig's music is amazing. I, I know that. Craig's music is amazing. Go check out Craig & Co. You can see his music there across the board, all of his music. Um, Craig mentioned Jewels of Alul. Go over to jewelsofalul.com and get your copy of this and get on the list so that every year when the new publication comes out, you will be notified. Craig is also on Facebook. Make sure you go check him out there. You're going to just type in Craig Taubman. You're going to, two things will come up, his personal profile, but you want his actual page because that's where all the excitement goes on. Um, and you also have a YouTube channel. So all we want you to do on YouTube is just go over to YouTube and put in the name Craig Taubman. And it will pop up. Now, lots of Craig Tobins are going to pop up. Just go through them. They're all great. And you'll find the one to subscribe. And you'll be able to hear all the new um, uh, music, the services, everything that's going on. Craig, we have, you have talked. We have talked. You have shared so much. And I know that there's so much more that you can share. But we're, gonna, we're running out of time. Is there a last thought that you'd like to share with the audience that maybe we just haven't touched on that you want to leave people with? Well, I always feel that, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Of course. Um, I appreciate it. And I'm sure mom and dad appreciate it too. <laughs> um, I always uh, like to reflect back and honor the people on whose shoulders I stand. And I've never met these people, but they're rabbis from the Talmud, and they came up with four uh, say, sayings that I think are, are, are very powerful and maybe people will identify with one of them. Who is smart? Uh, the person who learns from everybody. Who is heroic? The person who is able to conquer their, uh, their will. In other words, not, not just do whatever they want to do. Ezehu uh, Michubad, who is honored, Hamchabedet Habriot, the person who honors all of creation, not just creation that looks like them, but all of creation. Mm -hmm. And then it finishes off with Ezehu um, Sameach, Ezehu Ashir, who is rich, the person who is happy with their lot. Right. And right. it's not 
doesn't mean a lot, a lot, right? Or a little, a lot. It just means whatever your lot is to be samech bechelko, to be happy with your, with who you are and what you've been given and what you give. Well, thank you for that. Um, all all words to live by. I'm I'm on the wrong thing here. Let's just go over here. Oh my goodness, I lost my place here. Uh, follow us on Vital C. You can follow us on the uh, Facebook and Instagram at Vital C app. Check out all the new things that are happening. Craig, thank you for being with us today. We want to thank our audience. You have a choice as to where you spend your time. You chose to spend it with Craig and I today. We are eternally grateful. Go out and give somebody an awesome day, and we'll see you next time on the next Peak Stage. Goodbye, everyone.